We're going to continue looking at electric potential in a couple of other situations. To start with, we're going to look at the electric potential due to point charges and then due to charge distributions. You might have a little bit of fear of this word distribution because you know it's going to involve some integrals, but it turns out that the integrals aren't nearly as bad for finding the electric potential, largely because we don't have to worry about the direction because electric potential is a scalar. And in fact, later on, we're gonna see that it's easier to find the potential first and then use that to get the electric field rather than finding the electric field directly. All right, let's get to it. So here's our general expression relating the electric field and the difference in potential. And we're going to use this to find the potential due to a point charge, very similar in fact, identically to how we did with a charged sphere. So we can go ahead and plug in the electric field due to a point charge, which was kq over r squared. And then we're gonna make this dr. You can pull the k and the q out, but it doesn't really matter. This is exactly the integral we did before for the potential due to a charged sphere. And as long as we make the same choice of having um, the potential be zero way out at infinity then we get this nice expression here for the potential due to a point charge which as always can be written with a k instead of an epsilon naught so if we think about what's going on uh, if we're going to graph what's going on as we come from far away our potential starts out at zero out in infinity and gradually increases and then increases more sharply as r goes to zero. Uh, so we've got a one over r q uh, curve here. One over r curve, there we go. Uh, the sign does matter. If q is negative, then we start out at zero, and rather than increasing gradually, we decrease gradually and then sharply uh, as we approach that negative charge. So there you go. Let's do a problem real quick. Uh, if we have two charges, one that is smaller and one that is larger, and they start very far away, and we want to bring the smaller charge within a half a meter of the larger charge, how much work is that going to take? Well, work in general is the change in potential energy, and often we will write change in potential energy is equal to the negative work, and this expression assumes that we're talking about the work done by the conservative force that is associated with the potential energy. In this case, we're looking at the external force, which is going to be in the opposite direction of the electric force, which is the conservative force. So this actually becomes a positive sign if you're looking for the work done by the external force. We just need to find the change in potential energy, and we know the work done. So the change in potential energy is the final potential energy minus the initial potential energy. And we defined potential as potential energy per unit charge. Therefore, uh, potential energy is charge times the electric potential. So if we um, factor out a Q, then this becomes final potential minus initial potential. All of this is still going to equal the work done. Very long equal sign here. Uh, now we can also plug in the <clears throat> potential due to a point charge. So we're going to have Q, and each of these is going to be K big Q over R, and that's our R final, minus K big Q over R initial. So uh, this potential is the potential due to that charge, and then we're looking at moving this smaller charge through that potential. Okay, we can go ahead and factor out the uh, K and Q. So we have Q, K, Q. 1 over r minus 1 over r naught. And at this point, we can just go ahead and plug in stuff and get an answer. So this is 3 times 10 to the negative 6th. k, 9 times 10 to the 9th. The other q, 20 times 10 to the negative 6th. And then these r's, the r final is where we end up. So that is the half meter. Our initial great distance away is another way of saying infinitely far away. So we divide by infinity and that goes to zero. So we just multiply out the rest of this stuff and we get a measly little 1.08 joules to bring those two charges together. All right, let's look at another situation. If we want to find the potential at locations A and B due to these two point charges here, plus 50 and minus 50 microcoulombs. 
So all we have to do, just like with electric fields, you just add together the contributions from the two different charges. But in this case, we don't even have to take into account direction. We don't have to do any uh, vector stuff with this. We just have to take into account the signs and then just add things up. So this is going to be the potential from charge 1 plus the potential from charge 2, and we just add those together. Each of those is going to be kq over r. So I will factor k out, so I'm going to have uh, negative 50 microcoulombs over the distance, which is 60 centimeters, 0.6 meters, plus 50 microcoulombs over the distance between charge 2 and location A, which is 0.3. You can factor a 50 out as well, so you'll have 50, sorry, k times 50 times 10 to the negative 6th times 1 over 0.3 minus 1 over 0.6 just because we like subtracting things last or whatever. Anyway, plug into that and you get 750,000 volts of electric potential at point A. For point B, we do the same thing. We sum the two. And you might notice, even though it's not labeled the 40 centimeter line, the 26 centimeters are the same and it's the same vertical distance. So both of those charges are equidistant from point B. And since they're in e equal in magnitude but opposite charges, you guessed it, those will sum to zero. And any point that is equidistant from these two charges will have zero potential, which is anything along this line right here, this perpendicular bisector, right? Okay, now the part you've all been waiting for, the integrals. If this is the equation for the potential due to a single charge, if I have a whole bunch of charges, more than just two or three, I'm going to have to break up the total charge into infinitesimal chunks, dq, and I'm going to have to sum over all of those infinitesimal chunks and take into account the distances to each of those little chunks. Let's do a couple of examples. First of our, eh, first of all, our good friend, the ring of charge. And typically, we're going to start out redefining dq in terms of dr or something else. But this one, we actually don't need to do that. I'm going to rewrite this as k. And the trick here is that r, which is the distance between dq and p, which is labeled x squared plus r squared, that is constant. So I can just pull it out, and I've got the integral of dq. Well, if this ring has a total charge q on it, adding up all of the little bits of charge better give me the total charge. So I get kq over r, and if we are interested as uh, <clears throat> if we're interested in v as a function of x, we can go ahead and substitute in for r, and then we're going to have kq over x squared plus big R squared, and that whole thing square rooted big R. By the way, is the radius of the ring there, so that's constant. This is just going to be as a function of x. So not too bad. One more example. We want to find the potential due to a charged um, plate, a spherical, not spherical, a circular plate, total charge Q once again. Now this time we do need to redefine dQ. So each little bit of charge is going to be the total charge divided by the total area, which is going to be pi r naught squared. So this is essentially a sigma, right, charge per unit area. And then we need to multiply that by the area of the little chunks we're going to break it up into. The most convenient thing to do is to break it up into rings. Each ring is going to have a radius of 2 pi r. I'm going to use a big R here because little r, this one here, is the distance along between point P and the, the point on the ring we're interested in. So I don't want to call it the same thing. And then, so that's the circumference, but I want an area, so I need to multiply that by an infinitesimal thickness. Again, I'm going to call it big R here. So if I plug that in, again, I'm going to switch this to K because it makes life a little easier. And then I can pull out all this stuff that's constant here when I'm making a substitution. We can get, go ahead and get rid of these pi's as well. So I've got a factor of 2 there. I've got Q, which is constant. Big R naught is the total radius of my disk. So that is constant. And then I'm left with a big R dr <clears throat> up top. In the numerator, I still have that little r. And I'm going to go ahead and write that in terms of x and big R, because big R is changing. 
And now we just go ahead and perform this integral. I start at the center of the ring, so I'm going to go from 0 and out to the outer edge of the ring, which is big R naught. I don't care how you do your integral, if you want to do it by hand or use Wolfram or your calculator or an integral table, whatever makes you happy. Uh, this is going to work out to be 2kq, that's not a q, yeah. no lambdas jumping, <laughs> lambdas, sigmas, it's getting a little late. All right, kq over big R naught squared, and this guy becomes x squared plus big R squared, square rooted, and then we're going to evaluate that from 0 to big R squared. And again, we integrated with respect to R, so we're going to plug that into R here, not to x, and this works out to be 2kq r naught squared, big fat bracket. We're going to have x squared plus big R naught squared, square rooted. And then we subtract the whole thing again. I've already factored out this part, plugging in a 0 for r squared. So we just have x squared to the 1 half power, which just becomes an x. So not the prettiest formula ever, but not the most difficult integral either. So there you have it, and I will see you next time.